Hey guys, this is Nick, and here are the latest Linux, open source, and privacy news for the first half of October 2020. This month, we have the release of KDE 5.20 and the Linux kernel 5.9, snaps getting automatic theming, and yet more laptops running Linux out of the box. Let's start right after this. This video is brought to you by Safing's Portmaster. Safing is an open source company which aims to help users protect their privacy and focus on transparency. They developed the Portmaster, a privacy suite that lets you protect your network usage and give you system-wide ad and tracking blocking capabilities. It's open source, completely modular, and lets you see what the system is trying to send and block it either on a global setting or on a per-app basis. The Portmaster is and will always be free, and it gives you a super practical dashboard where you can monitor your general security level and status, and you can dive into the various connections your device is trying to make, like here the Epic Game Store calling some unwanted tracking URL. That's where you can move to the global and app settings and block any type of connection or set up filter lists. The Portmaster is still under development and is in alpha, but you can download it for free from safing.io. You can also ask anything you'd like to the Safing team, either on Reddit, via email, Twitter. Try Portmaster for yourself and let the team know what you think. So let's start with the Linux news. Snaps have been criticized for not respecting the system's theme, but this might be improving pretty soon. SnapD will be able to monitor for theme changes and will check if the associated theme is installed for your snaps. If not, it will ask you if you'd like to install it, so your desktop can look nice and coherent. This can't be tested yet, but it's a marked improvement over the current situation, even though it seems you'll still need to restart the apps to apply the theme after it's been downloaded. Nvidia released a new version of its Linux driver, version 455.28. It adds support for the latest RTX models, the 3080, 3090 and the MX450, and fixes a bunch of bugs, including an interesting one that caused CPU increased usage in Vulkan games, including games running DXVK. This is pretty nice, since it means that Nvidia is actively fixing bugs that affect gaming on Linux, native or otherwise. They specifically mention Red Dead Redemption as a Steam Play title in their release notes. I already got the update through the graphics driver PPA for Ubuntu, so I think most rolling releases should already have it as well. What if Microsoft used Linux as the base of the next version of Windows? I know it's been discussed quite a lot lately and I have reservations about this line of thinking, but this post, written by one of the founding fathers of the open source movement, Eric S. Raymond, is still interesting to read and highlights some of the reasons why Microsoft could be getting closer to Linux and how they are already almost at a point where it would be feasible. I'll probably discuss this topic in a video soon. The Linux kernel version 5.9 was released. It brings better memory management and a new memory controller. These improvements should lead to better kernel memory usage. Boot times should also be faster thanks to a new compression method for the kernel. Support for the upcoming Radeon cards is also baked in, as well as for the Intel XE and Rocket Lake graphics, the Tegra X1 and X2 chips from Nvidia now have working audio, and various file systems have received patches and improvements, including BetterFS, XFS, X4 and F2FS. Plasma 5.20 was released. It brings an icon-only task manager by default with grouping of windows, a revamped system tray presented as grid of icons, the on-screen display elements that appear when you change the volume or brightness have been redesigned to look more elegant and use less screen space, and Kwin now uses the super key to move and resize windows instead of Alt. You also get a notification when your system runs out of space, and the device notification applet now shows old disks, not just the removable ones. The system settings have also received a bunch of improvements, as always, most notably being able to show you what settings have been changed from their default values. I'll make a video about it very, very soon to recap all of these changes. Now onto the open source news. Purism launched a mobile phone plan called Awesome, built as made for privacy conscious users. At $99 a month, it seems only available in the US and will bring unlimited texts, talk and data. What's weird is that Purism is the account holder, not you, so the carrier can't actually know who is using the line, but if Purism shuts down or cans the service, you also lose your phone plan. It has no contract lockdown, you can cancel at any time, and it also supports 5G. I can't judge the prices here since I don't live in the US, but I have the same service for 5 euros a month here in France, so for me it's not good value. Google will relinquish control of the Knative Kubernetes project. It will move to a 5-seat committee that have rules in place to prevent a single organization to have more than 2 seats. It looks like Google is trying to extract themselves from the recent criticisms that it aims to keep a tight grip on open source projects that might impact how the internet works in general. 
KNAD falls into that category as a project that provides components to deploy, run and manage serverless cloud applications on top of Kubernetes, another Google-built open source project. Purism, the makers of the Librem 5 phone that we just talked about, are also launching a campaign to let you bid on the apps you want to see ported to their mobile GNOME version called Fosh. The Fund Your App campaign will allow people to vote with their wallets, literally, on the various applications that they want to see ported to Linux phones, either through native toolkits, through Anbox, a project that lets you run Android apps, or as a progressive web application. The approach is interesting, to say the least. Letting people vote to see which efforts should be prioritized is a good idea, but judging that on the money people paid seems pretty scammy to me, as there doesn't seem to be any guarantee that the money you donated will actually be used to port the app you requested. On to the gaming news. Debian announced a gaming-focused event called Mini DebConf Online No. 2 Gaming Edition. It will take place at the end of November 2020 and aims to hold sessions to cover gaming engines, host some Linux game developers, looking at the tools that we have on Linux to create game assets, or showcasing a bunch of games packaged for Debian. It's interesting, since Debian hasn't traditionally been the platform of choice for Linux gaming, and it shows that this precise topic might be the gateway to get more people into Linux proper. DXVK 1.7.2 is out, with fixes for D3D9, improved rendering on AMD drivers for some Unity games, and fixes for Baldur's Gate 3, Final Fantasy XIV, Just Cause 3, Marvel's Avengers, or Need for Speed Heat. This new version will be integrated into the next Proton release, or you can install it manually in your Proton folder in your Steam library. Wine 5.19 was released with a new version of Wine Mono, supporting Windows Presentation Foundation text formatting, and 27 bug fixes, including for Max Payne 1, The Sims Complete Collection, Silent Hill 4, Fallout New Vegas, or the Resident Evil and Resident Evil Zero Remastered. I'd expect Wine 5.19 to be the base for the next release of Proton, which is already available for testing. Feral announced that a Total War Troy port is still coming to Linux. They don't have any news to share as of yet, but that's to be expected since the game is for now an Epic Games Store exclusive, and as such not distributable for Linux. I'd expect the port to release at the same time as the Steam Windows version, if we're lucky. I'm a huge Total War fan and an ancient Greek history nerd, so this game is right up my alley, and I hope we can see it soon running natively on our platform of choice. Now let's move on to the hardware news. Another news video, another tuxedo laptop. These guys are really putting the pedal to the metal, and are releasing another laptop running Linux. The Aura 15 is meant for businesses and is a powerful workstation, with a Ryzen 7 4700U, LTE connectivity, and integrated Vega 7 graphics. It comes with a 15-inch Full HD display, an enormous selection of ports including USB-A, USB-C, HDMI, Ethernet or a microSD card reader. It looks like a good machine for anyone doing a bit of office work and occasionally needs a bit of GPU power. You can configure it and order it from Tuxedo's website. Another powerful laptop with a redesigned website as well, the Kubuntu Focus 2 has been released. Like the first iteration, it has beefy specs with up to an RTX 2080, 64GB of RAM, 4TB of SSD storage, and a 10th gen Core i7. Of course, this top spec machine will cost you at more than $4,500. Obviously, it comes with KDE Neon and it looks pretty good for a big thick boy. You can order it right now from their website. Now let's talk about apps. Krita 4.4.0 was released with a bunch of new features. Fill layers are now multi-threaded, so the app should have better performance, and the pattern of these layers can now be transformed and rotated. The SC expression language used by Disney Animation is now supported. It's a shader language that will let people generate materials and textures on the fly. Gradients can now also dynamically change using the selected foreground and background colors. There's a lot to this release, and digital artists will probably want to update as soon as possible. A super important application also has been released on Linux, and that's the Windows Calculator. Okay, so no one really needed that, but it's interesting nonetheless. The Uno platform team has ported this piece of software, very much only made for Windows, to Linux using their library, the Uno platform. While it's a simple app, it could be an avenue for developers to offer their app on Linux with minimal changes to their code base, so I thought it was worth mentioning. And finally, PTV, the GTK video editor, has sent its first 1.0 release, at last. Well, the naming scheme has been changed, so it's not version 1.0, it's version 2020.09. PTV is a pretty capable, non-linear video editor, which I'd compare to iMovie, and it integrates well within GNOME or Elementary OS. 
I actually started the channel using PTV and the list of new features is actually quite good. A new plugin system, a new welcome experience, a redesigned effects library and a lot more. If Kdenlive has been treating you badly, maybe give PDV a shot, it's a really good piece of software. And that's it for this video guys, I hope you enjoyed, if you did don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to receive more Linux news videos like this one. If you really want to help support the channel, you can also join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a monthly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover in my next videos. Check it out in the description below. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!